Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Mary Jordan, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and the executive team, I'd like to welcome you to our annual public meeting. 2013 was a year of change. We welcomed Craig Richmond back, this time to serve as our CEO, and we hit a new milestone in terms of passenger traffic. Today's meeting is for the purpose of reporting to you on last year and speaking with you about the challenges ahead. After the presentation, we will turn to you for your questions, comments, and suggestions. Before we started, I saw some of you checking out the three interactive displays at the back of the room. One is about the Designer Outlet Center, one about the Domestic Terminal Construction Program, and one is about our most recent innovation and successful export, our automated border and passport kiosks. If you didn't get a chance before the meeting, I want you to know that you are welcome to visit them and chat with our team members after the question and answer session. This afternoon, you'll hear from five airport authority executives, starting with Glenn McCoy on the 2013 financial results. Then, Steve Hankinson on our operational performance, followed by Don Ehrenholtz, who will talk about our capital program, and Ann Murray will speak about environmental performance and our involvement in the community. Finally, Craig Richmond will talk about providing connections that work. This year, we thought it would be good to hear from other members of the team, so I'm pleased to say we will also be hearing about three specific initiatives from Heather Jo McCarley, Tobias Finke, and Elaine Fisher. Before the presentations, I have some formal duties to perform. First, to announce that audio and visual recording devices are active. We are streaming live on YVR.ca. And after the meeting, we will post all these proceedings on our website. Second, it is my job to remind everyone that the Airport Authority is a private, not-for-profit corporation. There are no equity shareholders, so there are no monies distributed as dividends. Rather, all earnings are reinvested in the airport, invested in delivering on our fundamental mandate, support to our community by connecting BC proudly to the world. The people responsible for the governance of the Airport Authority are the 14 members of its Board of Directors. The Board is made up of directors appointed by outside organizations. There are nine such appointed directors. And in addition, the full Board of Directors appoints four directors from the community at large. I've already introduced myself, and the Board has elected me to serve as chair. Craig Richmond, as Chief Executive Officer, is automatically a member of the Board. Brian Bentz is the appointee of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of British Columbia. Joseph Caron is an appointee of the Board chosen from the community at large. George Cadman and Peter Webster are the appointees of the Government of Canada. John Curry is an appointee of the Board chosen from the community at large. Anna Fung is the appointee of the Law Society of British Columbia. Ken Goosen is the appointee of the Association of Professional Engineers and Geoscientists of British Columbia. Graydon Hayward is the appointee of the Vancouver Board of Trade. Howard Jampolsky is the appointee of the City of Richmond. Jerry Sinclair is an appointee of the board chosen from the community at large and Tamara Vrooman is the appointee of the City of Vancouver. One member of our board will soon be stepping down after serving with distinction as the appointee of Metro Vancouver for the past six years. And I would like to take a moment on behalf of the whole board to say a few words about Wilson Parasuk. Wilson has brought enthusiasm, intelligence, and diligence to every assignment be it on a task force or the Finance and Audit Committee or the Planning and Development Committee. That would be more than enough, but it doesn't quite capture Wilson's unique contribution. His experience in both the public and private sectors, his broad travels in the world, and his intellectual range produce probing questions and insightful comments that have always enhanced the level of our deliberations. 
For the board and for the community you have served so well, Wilson, may I say, for your hard work and dedicated service, thank you. Before I turn the program over to Glenn, I have another piece of official business that is to formally present to this meeting our 2013 Annual and Sustainability Report. The theme of this year's report is Connections That Work. Our full Annual and Sustainability Report was published on our website on April 24th, fulfilling our commitment to make the report available for your review well in advance of today's meeting. Available in the room today are summary brochures that give highlights from the annual report. If you want a printed version of the whole report, you can download it, or if you leave your name or give us a call, we will print and mail it to you. We invited people to submit questions in advance, and I'm pleased to say we received some. We have answered a few directly, and where it seems there would be general interest, we incorporated the answers into the presentations. So thanks for helping us make this meeting better. We welcome your feedback on our annual reporting as we try to continually improve it. I'd now like to welcome Glenn McCoy, Senior Vice President Finance, and our Chief Financial Officer to, pre to present the financial statements. Uh, thank you, Mary, and good afternoon. I will be presenting the highlights of our 2013 non-consolidated financial statements, which cover the Airport Authority's activities here at YVR. The Airport Authority earns revenue from three main sources. The first source is aeronautical revenue in the form of landing and terminal fees, collected recovered costs related to airline operations. The rev this revenue amounted to $122 million in 2013, up from $120 million in 2012. In 2011, the Airport Authority introduced the Gateway Incentive Program, a five-year program that freezes total aeronautical charges at 2010 levels, regardless of actual levels of landed weight and aircraft capacity. The increased revenue in 2013 came mainly from a 3% rate increase for the carriers who did not participate in the Gateway Incentive Program. The second source is non-aeronautical revenue, which includes revenues from concessions, such as duty-free stores and car rentals, car parking, and land and terminal rents. Revenue from these sources increased to $190 million in 2013, up from $176 million in 2012, due mainly to increases in concessions including duty-free, increased land lease and contribution revenue, as well as the sale of automated passport control or APC kiosks to other airports. The third source of revenue is the Airport Improvement Fee, or AIF. To help fund capital projects, the Airport Authority collects the AIF. Total revenue earned from the fee in 2012, pardon me, in 2013 was 122 million, up from 107 million in 2012, mainly from the effect of a full year of the AIF rate increase implemented on May 1st, 2012. In summary, total revenue earned from the th these three sources in 2013 was 433 million, with the majority of revenue, 44 percent, coming from non-aeronautical, part of the airport authority's strategy to keep AIF rates and airline charges low. Turning to expenses, a portion of non-AIF revenue goes towards covering the cost of operating the airport. We spend money on items such as safety and security, maintenance, cleaning, customer care, salaries, natural gas and other utilities, insurance, as well as payments to local governments. In 2013, these costs increased by $9 million, from $141 million to $150 million. The increase is mainly due to costs for management consulting, terminal repair and maintenance, utilities, RCMP, AIF commissions, and the cost of APC kiosks sold to other airports. The Airport Authority also uses a portion of its revenue to pay ground lease rent to the federal government. In 2013, the rent expense increased by $3 million, from $39 million to $42 million. The increase in rent was due to increased revenue, as I described earlier, as the ground lease rent payment is determined as a percentage of revenue. When the total cash needed to pay for capital projects during any year exceeds the amount of cash available after payment of operating costs, ground lease and interest costs, debt financing is required. The Airport Authority takes a conservative approach to debt financing <coughs> excuse me, and strives to achieve a reasonable balance between debt and sources of revenue. We currently have $550 million of long-term debt, and last year we did not incur any short-term borrowings. 
Debt carries interest payments, which in 2013 amounted to $32 million, unchanged from 2012. It's required under generally accepted accounting principles. In the statement of operations, the cost of capital projects is spread over the useful life of the projects, as opposed to being recognized as the cash paid each year during the project's construction. This spreading of the cost over the useful life is referred to as amortization on the statement of operations. Total amortization in 2013 amounted to $111 million, up from $108 million in 2012, as a number of new projects came into service and began to be amortized. Don Ehrenholtz will talk about our capital program in a few minutes. In 2013, the Airport Authority recorded a write-off of a capital asset, an airside screening facility, that was demolished to make way for work related to the AB connector project, which net of dividends and foreign exchange results in the $2 million cost you see here. The total excessive revenue over expenses was $97 million in 2013, up from $85 million in 2012, due principally to increased revenue from the AIF, concessions, and the sale of APC kiosks. When we adjust our excessive revenue over expenses to a cash basis, we add back amortization, which is non-cash expense. In 2013, the Airport Authority generated $206 million of cash flow prior to investment in capital projects, which is made up of the two amounts shown here. 89 million net cash flow from operations, plus 117 million of net of collection costs from the AIF. During 2013, the Airport Authority invested 186 million of this cash in capital projects. This left 20 million in net cash generated during the year, which, when added to the 142 million of cash we had at the beginning of the year, leaves 162 million of cash available at year end which will be used to fund projects in 2014 and future years, all part of the $1.8 billion 10-year capital plan. One additional matter I'd like to highlight today is contained in our consolidated financial statements. As I mentioned at the beginning, our non-consolidated statements cover only the activities of the Airport Authority here at YVR. Consolidated statements combine the activities of the Airport Authority at YVR plus the financial results of our subsidiary companies, each separate companies and each with its own set of financial statements. Those subsidiaries include YVR Project Management, 100% owned by the Airport Authority, the Airport Authority's 50% ownership of the Designer Outlet Centre, and our 50% ownership of Vantage Airport Group. Today, Vantage operates nine airports in five countries. In 2013, Vantage experienced a substantial write-down on its investment in Liverpool John Lennon Airport in the UK, which was acquired in 2010. Despite a strong operational turnaround that led to significant improvements in customer service, amenities, and airline efficiency and reliability, Liverpool Airport has been impacted by a sustained economic decline, aggressive airline and airport competition, and a difficult regulatory environment. The combination of these external factors has led to a write-down of Vantage's investment in Liverpool and a loss of $49.7 million on the Authority's consolidated financial statements. Faced with the requirement to make additional investments in Liverpool, given the future prospects for the business, Vantage made a business decision not to make that additional investment and has therefore exited from Liverpool. It's important to note that the funds that the Airport Authority used to invest in Liverpool in 2010 came from the gains realized with the sale of 50% of Vantage Airport Group to city infrastructure investors in 2008. So the right down and loss, though substantial, does not impact the financial position or operations at YVR. With the exit from Liverpool, Vantage is financially sound and in partnership with the Airport Authority is well positioned for future success on new opportunities. So in closing, the Airport Authority remains very strong financially, one of only two airports in the world with a AA credit rating, the second highest rating for airports in the world. Thank you. I'm now pleased to introduce Steve Hankinson, Vice President Operations and Information Technology. Thank you, Glenn, and good afternoon. In 2013, YVR set a new record for the number of passengers, 17.9 million. That's more than four times the population of British Columbia, and we were just one busy day short of achieving 18 million passengers. Last year, we saw 263,000 takeoffs and landings on our runways. Everything from WestJet Encore Q400 turboprops to Air Canada Airbus 320s to Cathay Pacific's Boeing 777 and lots of other aircraft for plane spotters. 
We also have float plane and helicopter traffic. And when these takeoffs and landings are added to those using the runways, the total was just over 300,000 aircraft movements. And while I'm talking about our runways, it's our tradition to give the community a heads up about our summer, summer runway maintenance program. The South Runway is typically used 24 hours a day for both takeoffs and landings, while the North Runway is used primarily for landings, and it is closed from 10 p.m. to 7 a.m. To allow for important annual maintenance, the South Runway will be closed at night from July 4th to August 1st. During this time, our neighbors will see a change in how the runways operate. Aircraft will both land and take off on the north runway between 9 p.m. to 7 a.m. In addition, between May 12th and 27th, the north runway will occasionally be used for departures between the hours of 7 a.m. and 10 p.m. because we are installing a new instrument landing system. Why the art? is important for shippers across the province. BC businesses ranging from cherry growers in the Okanagan to live seafood wholesalers in Richmond ship just over 228,000 metric tons of cargo through YVR. That's an average of 620 tons of BC products making their way to international markets on airplanes every day. Fresh BC products can go from YVR to kitchens in China in under 24 hours. Those of you who are part of the airport community know how complex airports are and that we need to constantly evaluate the effectiveness of operations to ensure we don't miss anything and we get it right. This past year, our team made progress in several important areas, including safety and security, operational efficiency, and caring for our customers. The opening of the new Integrated Operations Center combined 10 functions in a single workspace, making it easier for the people who work there to collaborate, achieve greater efficiencies, and swiftly address issues as they arise. Last year, our business partners added eight new retail shops, services, and restaurants, providing new experiences and more choice for our customers. These included a new Burberry duty-free boutique, Canucks Bar and Grill Restaurant, Hudson's Bay Company Trading Post, and the Airport Butler Meet and Greet Concierge Service. My congratulations to Airport Butler, who received an award for Best New Consumer Service Concept for its personalized curb-to-cabin service for travelers. Caring for every customer who uses YVR is an essential part of our mission. To that end, we are employing existing and new tools to care for customers where they are. One of these tools is social media. We find that more and more passengers are asking quest questions via Twitter. We monitor Twitter 24-7. Our team will respond whether it's providing directions to the nearest sushi outlet or helping to find a dearly beloved stuffed toy lost in the terminal. Of course, playing a huge role in caring for every customer are our green coat volunteers. Over the past few years, we have expanded our Green Coat volunteer program, and now there are almost 500 dedicated volunteers who serve customers with a particular focus on customers connecting onward to other destinations. Last year, our Green Coat volunteers contributed more than 80,000 volunteer hours helping our customers. We thank each and every volunteer who helps to make YVR such a great airport. I know that some of our green coats are here at the meeting today, and I would now like to ask those green coats to please stand up and be acknowledged. Thank you. <laughs> 24,000 people work on Sea Island. It takes the efforts of all of these people to run an airport. Your phenomenal performance and the great job you do caring for our customers makes YVR a world leader when it comes to airports, an airport voted by customers as the best in North America. Over 13 million international customers worldwide participating in the annual SkyTrax survey 
picked YVR as the top airport. Not just once, but five years in a row. And YVR was not just the top airport in North America, we were also the top airport in our size category of 10 to 20 million passengers and were voted ninth overall in the world. My congratulations to the entire airport community. I also want to note that the Fairmont Vancouver Airport was awarded the best airport hotel in North America. So congratulations to the Fairmont as well. As I said at the beginning, airports are a large, complex business to operate. The airport authority does not do it alone. I'd like to take this occasion to thank all of our business partners, the airlines, government agencies, and retail and service providers for their contribution to caring for customers. It's all of us working together that has made YVR so successful. Safety and security are at the core of our business. I want to introduce Heather Jo McCarley, Manager, Airside Operations, who last April led the largest full-scale emergency exercise we have ever conducted at YVR. This was another example of collaboration by the airport community and our neighboring communities. Heather will share an overview of the event. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> On April 17 last year, 780 people from 30 different agencies came together at YVR to practice our emergency response. Following the principles of plan, prepare, and practice, we regularly host emergency scenario training events such as drills and discussion-based exercises, which we call tabletops, to test aspects of our plan against a variety of emergency scenarios. And every two years, we host a full-scale live exercise. In 2013, Vancouver Airport Authority delivered our largest emergency exercise in organization history, a planned response to an aircraft crash on land and in the water. This particular scenario requires specialized deployment, including aircraft rescue, firefighting, personnel, and equipment. And this kind of full-scale live exercise is important practice for the specific response to an aircraft emergency. But the main objective of exercise planning and delivery was to collaborate with our emergency response partners and the entire airport community. With 30 different agencies and 780 participants in the exercise, we achieved this goal. Participants included our airline and airport business partners, Richmond Fire Rescue, Richmond RCMP, BC Ambulance, four lower mainland hospitals, the Canadian Coast Guard, and the Canadian Forces Search and Rescue Team from Comox 442 Squadron, just to name a few. Immediately after the exercise, our emergency response services personnel began an intense six days of aircraft awareness training for the first in crews from Richmond Fire Rescue with the mobile aircraft fire trainer we used during the exercise. In 2013, YVR's team delivered a total of 56 days of training to 258 firefighters from the city of Richmond. Across all aspects of our emergency response plan, from airfield emergency response protocols to public and media communication, Lessons were learned and then integrated back into the plan to make it stronger. Through our emergency exercise program, continued stakeholder collaboration, and ongoing communication, we're working every day to ensure we are ready to respond to any emergency, anytime. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce Don Aaron Holtz, Vice President of Engineering. Thank you, Heather Joe. We have a very extensive construction program going on at the airport, and it's my pleasure to tell you about it. The domestic terminal was originally built in the late 1960s, and for the past 20 years, we've been upgrading the building section by section to bring it up to today's codes and to YVR standards to make it better for our airport customers and the airlines. The AB project involves demolishing and rebuilding one of the last remaining sections of the original terminal. The project is a huge challenge for our engineering and construction teams 
because we're working in close proximity to airline operations. With construction this close to aircraft, safety is paramount in everything being done. One of the first big challenges with this project was the delivery and installation of giant steel roof trusses for the building central rotunda. These trusses were so large, almost the size of a 737 aircraft, that they could not be delivered by road. We had to barge them into the airport and transport them on our aircraft taxiways at night to the construction site. You can watch a time-lapse video of the delivery and installation of these trusses and our interactive display just outside. The project team has worked very hard to minimize the impact of this project on airline operations and passengers. And I want to thank WestJet for their patience as this huge structure is going up around them. Once the project is done, it will provide great new facilities for passengers, including new shops and restaurants and comfortable spacious hold rooms as shown in this rendering. It's also going to make it easier for passengers to connect. And I'll talk about connections more when I discuss the next project. The AB project is on schedule and at the end of 2013 it was 50% complete. The first two new gates are going to open in June this year. The main rotunda shown in this photo will open in November this year and the entire project will be completed at the, in the summer of 2015. Next I'll discuss the expedited transfer facilities project. This project constructs a long, thin, three-story building expansion to the entire west side of the terminal. It includes new corridors with moving walks and a high-speed bag system starting at the AB project at the south end of the terminal and extending all the way to the north uh, end of the international terminal. This project is designed to make connections between international and domestic flights and domestic to international flights much easier and faster. It's also design, designed to allow some gates to switch from domestic to international operations, so-called swing gates, to make airline operations a lot more efficient. With two-thirds of a kilometer of moving walks, walking time for connection, connecting passengers will be significantly reduced. The new high-speed bag system will move transfer bags much faster between international and domestic flights. Today, it's a completely manual process. The combination of swing gates, connecting corridors and a high-speed bag system will reduce connection times for transfer passengers at YVR to under an hour, helping us to be more competitive, something that Craig will talk to you more about shortly. This is an enormous and complicated project and it's required a lot of creativity to ensure that 24-7 operations can continue at the airport. I'd like to thank Air Canada, for whose operations have been most impacted by this project, for working with us and being very patient while all this construction goes on around them. This project will be completed in the spring of 2016. Now I'd like to briefly talk about a few other projects that we completed last year to keep the airport infrastructure in top shape. We repaved Russ Baker Way last summer and did our best to minimize traffic disruptions. I'd like to thank the residents of Burkeville for their patience during this project. He also did some road work for aircraft, repaving taxiways and adding new center, lighting, light, light, new center line lighting to two existing taxiways. In addition, we upgraded a section of the dikes as part of our multi-year upgrade program and we expanded the terminals Pier A to accommodate the WestJet Encore operations which started last summer. We also part partnered with the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority to upgrade the transborder hold bag screening x-ray system with newer, faster, more reliable CTX 9800s. <laughs> I'd like to recognize our exceptional engineering team and the other airport authority departments that assisted them in delivery of the capital program last year. I would also like to acknowledge the work of our architectural and engineering consultants and all of our construction partners, including PCL, LEDCOR, Graham, and Carillion Construction. Together they have over 600 construction workers on the airport today. Now I'll turn the floor over to Tobias Finca, who will tell you about the exciting new airside operations building that will be home to our emergency response, airfield maintenance, and airside operations teams. Tobias, over to you. Thank you, Don. Good afternoon. 
I'm Tobias Finke, Manager of Airport Terminal Projects, currently managing the design and construction of the new integrated airside operations building. I would like to share with you a brief story on how emphasizing the value of teamwork and people is having a transformative impact on this project and the future of airside operations at Vivier. For this project, the main objective, which has been from the, from our focus from the onset of the project, is bringing people together with the goal of promoting safety and teamwork, two of our core values at Vivier. For the building itself and those who will occupy it, sharing workspace will create opportunities and synergies reinforcing these shared values. Once complete, this facility will be an integrated home to all airside operations staff, from airport emergency responders to airside planners. The process for planning this innovative facility required both vision as well as tremendous operational insight. Throughout the design and the construction of this project, YVR staff collaborated alongside architects, engineers, and contractors, creating and implementing a program for the building which will enhance the strong operational component already in existence with the airside ops team. As this was the first major project that VIVR awarded, awarded to Frankel Architecture, as well as Graham Construction and their subtrades, we felt it best to host a series of engaging workshops throughout the project with a strong emphasis, emphasis on collaboration and team building. These workshops provided a venue to focus our intent to align everyone's expectations and set the foundation for working together as a high-functioning team. Following YVR tradition, we have celebrated important project milestones, taken a step back to acknowledge the team with appreciation and recognition for their hard work and contributions to the project throughout the construction process. By choosing to emphasize the value of teamwork, it has been my experience that each member of our team takes ownership of and feels valued in their roles and responsibilities. I am confident that the project will continue to run successfully, setting the stage for future successes of our integrated airside operations team. This focus also provides a positive working experience, indoctrinating a new group of business partners into the YVR family. These companies and their employees are taking pride in their contributions towards building this innovative new facility and will now be able to share how they helped build an essential part of North America's best airport. Thank you. I would now like to introduce Anne Murray, Vice President, Marketing and Communication. Thank you, Tobias. Vancouver Airport Authority is here to serve British Columbians by providing great air service. We're also connected to this community and are working hard to become a sustainable airport. Today, I'll share some highlights of our activities from 2013. One year ago at this meeting, Mary Jordan announced plans for a major upgrade to Flight Path Park to pay tribute to Larry Berg, our outgoing CEO. Before we started the project, we consulted with our neighbors in Burkeville and heard requests for safe place to ride bikes, great play areas for kids, and nice spots for family picnics. We took that input and created a really attractive community amenity. The new Larry Berg Flight Path Park opened last September. It features a giant climbable globe, runway style walking paths, and viewing platforms, which offer a really great vantage for plane spotting. Our incredibly popular school program also continued in 2013. More than 1,500 students from 40 lower mainland schools toured the airport and learned about aviation through a hands-on approach. And because YVR is BC's gateway airport, we decided to take that YVR experience beyond the terminal. So last year, we launched the YVR Summer Festival program and participated in 15 community events across Metro Vancouver. Participants got to learn about YVR, played our interactive quiz, and asked lots of questions of the YVR community ambassadors who were on site. Through events like the Celebration of Lights, the Richmond Maritime Festival, Marpole Days, we reached 250,000 people, connecting with them in their own backyards. Now there's a lot of amazing organizations doing great things in our community, and we support them 
by contributing both volunteer time and financial resources. In 2013, we donated $760,000 to 69 different charities and organizations. The Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is a really interesting example. It's one of the largest direct action conservation programs in Canada, and we're really proud to be BC's sponsor. We hosted a kickoff event at the Iona Regional Park, which is right here beside Sea Island, and we had YBR volunteers, including servers from our restaurants and airport authority employees, all coming together to clean up the beach. We also partnered with other organizations like Vancouver Adaptive Snow Sports, Quest Food Exchange, Spinal Cord Injury BC. In 2013, we continued to keep our customers, stakeholders, and the general public informed and engaged through our proactive communication efforts. Our website, YBR.ca, is a popular online destination for all things YBR, from real-time flight information to promos, retail information. You can even actually book your parking reservation on YBR.ca. We're also proud of our social media connections. We've got an active presence on Twitter, at YBR Airport, responding to customer inquiries and talking with our stakeholders 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And as more of our customers engage with social media, our numbers grow. Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and our blog all saw over 50% growth in traffic last year. In 2013, we also connected with the community on the subject of noise. We sought input on what else could we be doing to reduce the effect of noise in the community as we went to update our five-year noise management plan. Our noise management committee was integral to developing the plan. Committee members include citizens, pilots, air traffic control, Musqueam Indian Band, Transport Canada, and I actually was talking to at least one member of the committee uh, out um, before the meeting started, so I want to thank the committee members who are here and also all of the committee members for their hard work in pulling together the new noise management plan. It's in front of the Minister of Transport right now, and once it's approved, we'll post it up on YBR.ca. We also work directly with the airlines and pilots to encourage noise reduction and reducing the noise impacts in the community. Last month, we announced the winners of the YBR Fly Quiet Awards. Now, the goal of these awards is to raise awareness on noise issues and encourage our airline partners to fly community friendly. So there's three categories based on aircraft size. The winner in the wide body jet aircraft is China Southern. US Airways took the prize for the narrow bodied aircraft and congratulations go out to Jazz for winning in the propeller category. We've also focused on reducing harmful greenhouse gas emissions and other pollution. Airport authority employees are encouraged to carpool or take transit through our Green Commuter program. And for customers and employees, the Canada Line has been an incredible success with over 16% of the people using that rapid transit line to come to YVR. And last year, we just added two electric vehicle charging stations in our parking facilities. And we've done a lot to encourage bicycling too. There is now a new off-road bike path that connects the number two road bridge to Larryburg Flight Path Park, where you can also find bike racks and a public bicycle repair station. Waste reduction is another important focus area for us, and so I'd like to uh, invite Elaine Fisher, our environmental specialist from our environment team, who's going to talk about our recycling effort for 2013. Thank you. Thank you, Anne. I'm Elaine Fisher, environmental specialist, and I'm excited to update you on YVR's waste reduction and diversion success in 2013. Almost 24,000 employees and almost 18 million passengers could generate a lot of garbage. Through our recycling programs, we're happy to report that over 38% of terminal waste was recycled and diverted from landfill. From used lights to wooden pallets, batteries to landscaping materials, we have many varied recycling streams at YVR. Especially noteworthy is the amount of concrete and asphalt that gets recycled. You've heard my colleagues talk about some of our ambitious construction projects, including building expansions and roadway and tarmac repavement. In 2013, construction projects at YVR generated 42 million kilograms of construction waste, a portion of which is demonstrated by this mountain of rubble on the screen. The good news is that 98% of construction material was successfully repurposed for projects both on and off airport. 
Concrete, for example, is crushed on site and reused for such things as road base and gravel replacement. Of particular focus in 2013 and continuing this year is the separation of organic material from our regular garbage stream. Here at YVR, this is comprised mostly of food scraps and food soiled paper. Many of you may already be familiar with this and be uh, separating organics and composting in your homes. Here at YVR, we're testing methods to determine the best way to capture this waste stream from our tenants and in public areas. Last year, we diverted almost 23,000 kilograms of organic material away from landfill, or equivalent to 156,000 apples sent to compost. And this is a fun fact featured in our YVR for Kids coloring book. I have extra copies if any of you would like one after the, after the meeting. Before bringing organic separation to all public areas, we wanted to determine exactly how much organic uh, food waste and other compostables we produce. So we did a little experiment. We collected waste over a specific period of time, spread it all out in a warehouse, divided it into categories, and it turns out that more than 60% of the waste in the food courts could be turned into compost. Target, targeting organics represents a great opportunity to make a difference and reduce the waste to landfill at YVR. The way we think about waste is changing. What was once garbage is now a renewable resource. You can help us in our waste reduction and diversion efforts uh, by looking for new organic bins in some of our food courts over the next few months. And in the meantime, please make sure to make good use of our separated waste and recycling bins located throughout the terminal. We'll be sure to keep our community informed on our recycling initiatives, so please pl check back at yvr.ca. Thank you. And now it gives me great pleasure to introduce the President and CEO of Vancouver Airport Authority, Craig Richmond. Well, thank you very much, Elaine. Good job. Hello, bonjour, ni hao, good afternoon, and welcome to our airport. Thank you very much for joining us at today's annual public meeting. It's my first meeting since I returned to YVR last July. I'm really happy to be here. I attended my share of Airport Authority uh, public meetings in the 90s and early 2000s when I first worked at YVR, but I have a very different viewpoint this time around. You know, I rejoined an airport in terrific shape, very lucky, and I would like to acknowledge my predecessor boss and mentor for many years, Mr. Larry Berg. Larry deftly managed the incredible balancing act that is YVR for a decade and a half, bringing us through both tough times like recessions and uplifting moments like the Vancouver 2010 Winter Olympic Games. He laid a solid financial foundation for the company, developed relationships with allies and friends across the world, and across the province, and he made a lot of difficult but far-reaching decisions that turned YVR into one of the best airports anywhere. Thanks, Larry. But what a time to return to YVR, Canada's second busiest airport, connecting a record 17.97 million passengers in 2013 and on pace to break 18.5 million in 2014. As you've heard from my colleagues here today, 2013 was a great growth year for our airport. We continued work on our capital construction program that will enable us to be the best connecting airport between the Americas and Asia. We broke ground on the Designer Outlet Center premium retail project. We launched automated passport control with U.S. Customs and Border Protection here at YVR and then immediately started selling it to major U.S. airports. We welcomed a very popular new route to Munich with Lufthansa, saw WestJet's first flights with Encore and ramped up frequency to places like Guangzhou so that by the time summer arrived, we had the most weekly flights to China of any North American airport. As Heather described, we staged the most comprehensive emergency exercise in our history, and we did all of this while delivering record levels of customer care, 91% satisfaction ratings. Yep, we've been busy, but why does all of this activity matter? Well, to me, it's a very interesting and significant point. After years spent at other airports, my return required an intensive immersion to the complex interconnected business of YVR. It's quite complicated. 
So I went back to basics to look at the original purpose of this company. In the simplest terms, we're an airport without shareholders, and any revenue after expenses is directed back into the airport to support our mission to provide safe and efficient air services. But if you've been to one of these meetings in the past, you've heard this. What I think is really exciting is the reason for this mission, to provide jobs and economic opportunity for the people of Richmond, Vancouver, and the entire province. We do this by providing direct jobs here at YVR and enabling many businesses beyond the airport to thrive as they go on to provide services to airlines, hotels, restaurants, newsstands, and many other enterprises involved in commercial air travel. Our business is to create jobs. In fact, let's follow that train of thought creatively for a moment. Last July, China Eastern Airlines added a second daily, a second daily flight between YVR and China. When this second daily flight arrived on July 19, 2013, it brought about 230 people to Metro Vancouver. The next day, the airline brought another 230 people. That same number arrived the day after and so on. So in less than one week, around 1,500 new additional tourists and business people had arrived in BC due to this second daily flight. These visitors took cabs, rented cars, bought meals, stayed in hotels. Some probably went shopping on Robson. Others played a round of golf. Some went whale watching. Others took the Pacific Coach Line Skylinks bus from YVR to Whistler for a few days. And almost every one of these visitors ate at restaurants. So think about the jobs required to support these visitors' travels. Everything from baggage handlers at the airport to the cooks and servers in those downtown restaurants and the wholesalers that supply local produce and the people that drive the goods to the restaurants. That multiplier effect is enormous. Now let me go off script for a moment, which may cause our communications people some angst, but I think it's worth it. I was driving in this morning at 6.45, and I normally don't drive in, I take the Canada line, and I'm driving along and suddenly I realized on the right is a produce truck, right out here on Grant McConaughey, and on the left is a FedEx truck, and in front of me was a hotel shuttle bus. And I laughed to myself and I said, this is my speech. And then suddenly I was surrounded by cabs, and then I saw one of the big buses heading to the employee parking lot, and I realized what a locus of commerce and jobs and paychecks the airport is. This is why we're pursuing air service opportunities so proactively. New flights mean new jobs, which is good for all of us. On that front, 2014 is shaping up very well indeed. I don't want to give away too much of my speech content for next year's meeting, but here's a preview. We're in major inaugural mode. Already this year, we've welcomed Boeing's next generation 787 Dreamliners operated by two airline partners, as well as two new airlines, All Nippon Airways and Air Canada Rouge, with another Iceland Air landing next week. But I'd better leave something for next year. My international experience taught me many things, but the most consistent message I heard over and over again overseas was about YVR and how we have such a positive reputation. Around the world, it really is a pleasure to sell the YVR experience. Airlines everywhere want to fly here. And that reputation is extremely helpful. But where does it go from here? Well, it comes down to our values and living them in everything we do in support of YVR and our community-driven message. Our values are safety, teamwork, accountability, and innovation, and we strive to live up to them in everything we do. We're on the right track, and we use these values to keep it up. Safety remains at the core of our operations and always remains at the top of our list in our minds. In fact, we start every executive, management, and almost every department meeting anywhere in the airport with a safety talk. And we are never, ever complacent when it comes to safety. Likewise, teamwork is part of our DNA. We include all of our business partners and our customers as part of our team. We cannot run this airport without the team spirit of all our partners. And I mean this, the entire community here works as a team, and that's why we're a great airport. In terms of accountability, well, we're community-based. We live here. We're accountable to each other and to you. That's why we commit to open, honest, timely communication, and if we say we'll do something, we do it. That's why we're here today at this meeting, and the reason for our many communications channels, everything from Twitter to the community festivals we attend. In this regard, I've recently met with a number of municipal councils for the first time in my new role, some of which nominate directors to our board. I was received most graciously by the councils, and they all had great things to say about the experience and importance, especially in jobs, of YVR. Our business relies on this goodwill and trust, 
and the support of these and other levels of government. Innovation has been part of the spirit of YVR from the start of the airport authority. It helps drive the business, helps keep us number one, and frankly, makes the place a lot of fun to work. To keep earning best-in-class awards, we have to think creatively about how to improve and sustain our business. So initiatives like the Designer Outlet Centre and the Border Express kiosks are great examples of this kind of thinking. In fact, tomorrow, we'll announce that the next generation of Border Express automated passport control kiosks will launch at YVR and Chicago's O'Hare International Airport. The latest design features biometric technology that will allow international travelers from 38 different countries that don't require a U.S. visa, which opens up this innovation to thousands more passengers here and at airports across the U.S. I think they're going to sell like iPad 3s. We'll strive to add more such value-adding enterprises thought up, tested, produced, and built right here in the Lower Mainland. And get it, if you get a chance afterwards, go and see the very friendly people and try out the automatic passport control kiosk. Better yet, if you're flying, you'll really notice the difference. When I first started this job, I realized one of the toughest challenges ahead of us was our own success. How do we continually improve on being number one, and how do we stay ahead of the competition? And believe me, there is some very serious competition out there, and they want to end our brilliant airport streak. Seattle, Calgary, San Francisco, LAX, Chicago, Toronto, and even Dallas have made public statements about how they would like to take traffic away from YVR, the flights we have now and the flights we want in the future. With longer range, more efficient aircraft, airlines have choices as to their routes and the airports they use. YVR and our partners in the travel industry in BC have to stay at the forefront of choice and have created innovative and attractive reasons to be a number one destination as well as a number one airport. In 2014, we'll continue developing our vision for a sustainable YVR. We'll be out to talk to you about our strategic plan and our new 10-year master plan. We'll also be consulting with the public on our new project to install runway and safety areas, or RESAs, a large multi-year project to add a new margin of safety to our runways for arriving and departing aircraft. We'll continue to work closely with our great federal government partners, including transport, immigration, and public safety, to address key policy areas that impact our ability to grow as a preferred gateway airport. While some impediments still stand in our way, I'm very pleased to report that we've made headway in several key areas in 2013, including the very important transit without visa issue and in liberalizing air agreements. These are critical for us to take advantage of the huge opportunities YVR has in Asia and South America. Now, we've also heard you loud and clear on frustrations with pre-board screening and have taken the lead, along with airports and airlines across Canada, to seek improved efficiencies with our partners at the Canadian Air Transport Security Authority, known as CATSA, and to ensure that Transport Canada sends them enough funding to keep up with our growth. We cannot grow and we cannot provide good service if security does not grow with us. I'm very proud to count myself amongst the 24,000 employees who get to come to work at YVR, North America's best airport. It's a tremendous honor, and I love the design, the art, and architecture of the airport, and we have spent a lot of time and effort making our airport look and feel great. But this is about much more than that. It encompasses our commitment to customer care, to safe and efficient operations, and our award-winning shopping and dining. Most importantly, it's a powerful testament to the airport community's best efforts each and every day to share the magic of YVR with each and every passenger, making their journeys easy, pleasant, and safe. Guided by our great people, our history, and our values, I promise that we will continue to strive for excellence by building global routes, creating local jobs, contributing to the economy, investing in our community, and by providing connections that work. And I thank you for being a part of this bright future. Thanks. New boss, new way of doing the APM. I would also like to thank our managers, Heather, Joe, Tobias, and Elaine, who braved the stage, did an excellent job. Stand up, take a bow. Well done. Now, over the past few weeks, we invited the community to email us their questions in advance, and we received a few. To start things off, 
I'll, I'll address a question from one of our regular customers, uh, F. Pennet Raymond, who asked, has Vancouver Airport Authority addressed the problem of the thousands of passengers flocking to the Bellingham Seattle Airport? Second, is YVR addressing the issue of high federal taxes associated flying out of YVR to compete against the American airports? And finally, YVR is also a splendid airport, thank you, but why do uh, we bother upgrading and renovating the airport if people go somewhere else? I'm just going to shift microphone. Um, hello? Is that working? You know, it's a very good question. In fact, I was standing not far from here. It was the very first question I was asked uh, during the announcement last June, the Bellingham issue. Uh, and, and I've wrestled with this because we would like everybody in BC to fly out of Vancouver. But I also recognize that Bellingham, of course, is in a different country with an entirely different cost structure. As you heard Glenn earlier mention, we paid $42 million in rent uh, last year, and the Bellingham Airport gets grants from the federal government and the states to run the airport. So they have a very different cost structure. Um, and so I don't think that uh, given that cost structure and others, like Air, trans or air transport security charges, the air navigation system, that we can compete on cost with Bellingham. So I see them as a complementary airport for people that want to fly an ultra low cost, ultra cheap vacation. And you know, I can't, I can't argue with that. What I can offer is that Vancouver is a high quality, high value airport. And if you want to fly to one of 160 destinations around the world, then YVR is where you'll want to come. So that's the first question. Um, if any of you have questions, please either make your way to the microphone located right there in front of me, or wave your hand and we'll bring one to you. And if you could just start, please, by telling us your name and your connection to the airport. And I'm ready to answer any questions. Thank you. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Gregg. I have no connection with the airport. But I would like to say I'm very proud as a Vancouverite of the airport. I'm happy to show people when they come here what a great place it is. I have no connection with the airport other than that. Um, thank you very much. I'd like to thank you uh, for taking the time and the courage to have an open house and offer to answer questions. In particular, the compliment I have is regarding the recent bike installations from number two road bridge to Burkeville. And I have a question associated with that. Uh, for those that don't know anything about the bike path, um, it's beautifully done. It's um, a real asset to the community, not just Burkeville, but also people uh, moving through by bicycle from Vancouver uh, to Richmond, Steveston, and so on. So the question I have for you in particular is um, we have this connection perhaps that doesn't quite work. And that connection is actually at the intersection of Miller Road and Russ Baker. Uh, it's actually quite dangerous, not just for serious cyclists, uh, but also for your own staff accessing the airport. So what I'd like to ask is, um, would you please give consideration to reviewing the timeline for improvements for cyclists to access through that connection from where we are to the Canada Line Bridge? Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the kind words, and uh, thanks for, for the, uh, the words about the bike lane. Uh, yes, uh, we acknowledge that it is an issue, and uh, in keeping with the best traditions uh, of a CEO, I would like to pass this question over to a cyclist. <laughs> and uh, my, uh, my VP of Marketing and Communi Communications, Ann Murray, to, uh, to address your issue. Sorry, put it way up there. There you go. Um, I know exactly the intersection that you're talking about. Um, and I know how great it is to have the Canada Line Bridge uh, because that creates a really nice safe crossing over the North Arm. So what we have is a multi-year plan to upgrade uh, and improve all of those connections. I don't recall offhand which, whether that intersection is happening this summer, but I know exactly where you mean and I can follow up afterwards with the detail of which part comes next. Thank you, Anne. Richard. Wait, uh, they're going to bring a mic to you. I, kn I know you can shout. 
My name is Richard Cook, ex-airline employee, ex-Transport Canada employee, ex-Airport Authority employee, ex, now I'm a green coat. I have three quick questions for you. One is, any progress in getting beyond Asia to Mumbai or Delhi? Number two is, we used to have flights that went from South America to Vancouver, and Vancouver to Tokyo, Hong Kong, now it would go to Korea. Are we having any success in getting those flights back? Two There's them. great uh, potential in South America, thinning tractors to head office here, mining. The students come up to Vancouver via Toronto for English as a second language. And there's a big Korean community that fly, used to fly with us from South America to Vancouver to Tokyo and on to Seoul. That's number two. Okay. Uh, good questions. Okay. Um, one of the first questions I asked when I got here was, wh why don't we have a direct flight to South Asia? We have such a great population here. And uh, I, you know, talked to our marketing folks, talked directly to the airlines. It's just a long ways. And that extra two or three hours, depending on the winds, uh, that takes you past Shanghai to Mumbai uh, just kills the yield. And uh, many airlines have tried it, and few have succeeded given the current technology. Uh, I'm a little bit uh, excited about the new triple X, uh, new triple seven X, uh, the 787, some of the variants. That may, with the vast fuel efficiencies, that may bring Mumbai into range. Um, I also think, though, and, and uh, we're working with our, our uh, marketing team, is working with the federal government negotiators to get something into South Asia that then could lead on to Mumbai. Uh, we think it's a huge market, and we, we haven't forgotten it. Uh, the second question is, is uh, really what we're all about. You know, the two biggest growing economies in the world are in South America and in Asia. And uh, we, if you actually took a globe, and took a string from, say, Sao Paulo to Beijing, we are right on that line. It's a huge geographic advantage. We're doing everything we can to, to work with the government to encourage transit without visa, for example, for somebody from Chile to China or vice versa. And then, yes, we can recapture that South American traffic, which, by the way, is huge volumes, huge volumes of people that want to transfer from South America to Asia and, and back. And we could become known in the world as the transit hub for that kind of traffic. And all we need is the federal government to come on board and working very hard with them. And I'm encouraged at our initial work. Thank you. I was getting worried, David. I wasn't, Craig. <clears throat> I'm the reason that Larry Berg took retirement. <laughs> my name is David Varnes. I'm with the Machinist Union. My connection with the Vancouver International Airport is that this is my 21st time here as an intervener at these public hearings. And I have a wonderful time when I come, because I like to watch Craig sweat. Uh, let's start off with... Um, just an interesting observation. When I went on your website last week as I started to do my homework, um, I noticed that in the annual report you listed the executive team and you added somebody last year. You added Mr. Bruno and he didn't end up on the annual report. Was he a bad boy? No, Mr. Bruno is not an officer of the company. Uh, he's a, he's a, uh, uh, at the VP level, working for us on those important issues such as transit without visa. Okay. Um, probably this one, you're going to have to, you're probably going to drag up a few of the executive officers on some of these questions, but uh, let's... I hope so. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd hate to nail you with all of them. Um, in the financial report, you've listed a number of subsidies and you've outlined what they do, but you also have a, a section on the subsidy that indicates that you have a marketing arm in Hong Kong uh, called YVRHK, and its purpose is to promote YVRA services to Asian customers, airlines, and tour companies. Now, why is there no reporting on its financial activity and specifically information to the general public and what's this costing the airport authority? 
Uh, I think you're talking about subsidiaries, just to be clear, not subsidies. Uh, it's not a subsidiary. Um, right now, we've had a Hong Kong office for several years. Uh, it's a remarkably effective office with a remarkably effective and dynamic individual there, uh, Ms. Dora Kay, who is fluent in, uh, in uh, both Mand Mandarin and Cantonese and helps us out in developing our Asian market. So she's running a, 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 an office there. We're actually expanding that office, but it's, it's not a subsidiary. It's just like a department. It's the Hong, Hong Kong Department of YVR. And if imitation is the best form of flattery, I just heard about a week ago that uh, Toronto is opening a Hong Kong office uh, because I think they, uh, they realize how successful it has been for us. Um, under Glenn's report, when he was talking about uh, both consolidated and non-consolidated figures for 2013, he mentioned that in 2010, we started the Gateway Incentive Program, and in his report, he indicated that a number of airlines had not joined that program. Could he report to the public what airlines have become part of that program? Well, uh, I know about 80% of our airlines have done it, but uh, perhaps Glenn could come up and talk a little bit about the Gateway, Gateway Incentive Program. Yeah, so as Craig said, airlines carrying about 80 to 85% of our passengers signed up. I won't go through the whole list, Dave, of what the no, names of the no, companies not, are, yeah, but yeah. what that program did was allow carriers to essentially pay what they paid in 2010 for each of the next five years. So if they added a new flight, there was no cost for that additional flight. Their average cost went down. It was a way for us to try to incent additional service here, create economic development and jobs that go with it. Yeah, uh, my point was, of course, in the report, you give an indication of the uh, existence of the incentive program, but you did not clearly outline who's actually taking advantage of it. So you'd have some idea, uh, a member reading this report would have some idea whether this has been a, an effective program or not. Right. So we've okay. had a lot of our big carriers have done, but for a variety yeah. of reasons, airlines have made decisions as to whether to participate or not. So. Okay. And don't go away. Mm -hmm. um, I think it was two years ago that the airlines reached an agreement with the airport authority to start collecting the AIF fee directly on the ticket and that you would pay a percentage or some kind of fee for the performance of that work. Uh, can you tell me, uh, is the AIF commission paid to the airlines for the collection of the fee still 3%? And also, what amount of commissions did you pay to the airlines in 2013? Uh, we first had the airlines start to collect on the ticket in 2004, so it was more than a couple okay. of years ago. Uh, the commission rate is 4%, and the total of up. that commission would be... No, it hasn't gone up. It's the same since day one. It was 4%. Was four? Okay. Yes, it is. Yeah. I'll go back in my notes. I said, I'm sure it was 3 but that's okay. Well, I'm happy to go look for a refund, Dave, if you can help <laughs> me out here. Keep that in mind, Glenn. <laughs> Uh, one of the major issues in the community that's cropped up in the last couple of years is RCMP policing. I note that in your summary of costs that you pay for in terms of services delivered to the airport, that it also con includes um, the RCMP presence. Uh, do you pay for that directly as the airport authority? Do you share it with the city of Richmond? And what are your policing costs uh, for 2013? And do you anticipate having to pay more uh, in the following years? So we pay the City of Richmond for the provision of RCMP officers here at YVR. The amount in 2013 was just over $4 million. Uh, Steve is working on, with his team on a new arrangement with the City of, of Richmond around the provision of police services going forward. Okay, thank you. Um, Can Glenn be released? Do you want to no. take over? <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, actually, yes. I think I, think I, I need a fresh victim. Okay. Uh, this next one. What is the corporate systems project uh, that is payable by AIF revenue? What does that do? Boy, that was a big IT project. Uh, it came out of one of our efficient YVR initiatives, and basically it ties in a lot of the accounting, purchasing, all those systems together. Very complex IT project. Okay. Um, in the Human Resources and Compensation Committee report that's referenced in, uh, I believe that's in the governance section uh, of uh, the uh, report, it says that there will be a report on executive pay arrangements for 2014. Uh, will that report be available to the public to read? 
Um, I think the report you're referring to is, is an internal board report. Uh, the, you'll note in that same section that uh, the salaries of uh, board members and of executives are a range is given in the, in the annual report. Uh, yes, I have noted that. Um, there were a number of single source contracts awarded in two thir 2013 without the benefit of tender. In fact, this year is probably the longest list I've seen in a very long time in my period of time here as a uh, purveyor of questions. Uh, on many of these awards, the draft published description is very vague. For example, there was a $10.27 million contract for Vanderland Industries for design services, but it gives no indication what services were offered. What were they doing? Baggage systems. Thank you. There was a $1.29 million contract to Booz and Company for consulting services. What were they consulted for? Just for the record, I want to say that's Booz with no E at the end. <laughs> we, a no, we had a good time with this one last year, Craig. <laughs> There's a management, they're a management consulting team we've worked with for years, some on, on our efficiency uh, YVR initiatives from several years ago, and uh, they're so good, and we, we trained them so well because you have to understand the business before you can actually comment on it that we decided to keep them on for some other projects. There's a $4.02 million contract that was awarded to Jacobs Brothers for an urgent contract, but there's no indication what was the or any details of the urgency. What did Jacobs Brothers have to do as of an urgent nature for the airport authority? Well, thank you very much for spreading this around, Don. <laughs> our VP of Engineering, I think he could probably tell you what that was. Yes, uh, last spring we, uh, we uh, learned from uh, WestJet that they were going to start the Encore uh, services and uh, with the new uh, Q400 operation and we found out essentially in February that we needed to have space for three more aircraft on the ground by the uh, middle of June. So uh, we uh, worked with Jacob Brothers who was working on an adjacent project to uh, complete that work. Um, in a fairly urgent and quick manner. So were you just talking more aprons? Is this what we were talking? Uh, it consisted of uh, pavement, apron, pavement, and uh, tent. Okay. Um, Thanks, Don. Here's an interesting one. Um, I noted with interest, maybe this, this when we finally get a chance at Ann, <clears throat> initiated several lighting saving programs. What, one of which was changes to the overhead lighting on the Arthur Lang Bridge in 2013. Does the airport authority own the bridge? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> more toys. Um, I was just going to make a remark on something else, and that was also under uh, Ann's report. The airport authority and the community involved uh, plays a very large role each year in assisting with the annual United Way campaign. Uh, you have mentioned yourself that there's now either directly or indirectly almost 24,000 people who are involved with the airport authority. Uh, and I'm wondering whether at some point it might be opportune to have a dialogue with some of your smaller uh, suppliers or even some of the big ones like the airlines uh, for a coordinated effort such that the un annual United Way campaign could embrace a larger community and the, computer, the community itself, that is the, uh, the airport, could make a larger contribution to that very worthwhile organization. You know, it's a really good idea. Uh, we'll look at it. I think uh, combining always helps. Uh, we, we traditionally, as the airport, we match the donations of our employees. I'm not sure we're up to matching the donations of 24,000 no, people. No, you have another question intent, for me next, uh, yeah. next year. But I think the idea of, of, of a getting coordinated together, campaign. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. We'll talk about that. So All please right. don't leave after your questions. Uh, <laughs> in the annual report on the social section, it was noted that the airport authority supports 10 apprentices in the skilled trades employee group. What kinds of training are these apprentices receiving? Well, I don't think we need to. Okay, we will. Uh, we'll get uh, our, our uh, VP of HR and Supply Management, Michelle. But we need to come up and talk about that. Yeah. 
We have a, a dual ticketing program where our trades come in with one ticket and then we apprentice them in a second ticket. Typically they're millwright and apprenticeship programs uh, for electricians. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Um, oh, here's, here's Ann Zinger. Ann, in the consolidated financial statements, there's been a disclaimer published for more than a dozen years now about the ongoing dispute between the federal government and the airport authority over responsibility for the removal of hazardous materials on the airport site prior to July 1, 1992. The federal government takes the position that they will remove the hazardous materials when directed to do so by the appropriate federal agency. Of course, since the government controls the agency, the order will never come. Are you planning to take the federal government to court in order to get action on this blatant Mexican standoff? No, we don't have any, time, any plans to go to court right now. But certainly it's something we press them on and something that if we uh, ever really need to, uh, to get in there and, and use that land, we will be looking for, the, uh, for them to pay. We, we won't let go of this, but I'm not sure that we would win that at this time. Okay. Uh, in the consolidated financial statements on page 15 on paragraph C, there's a statement about the uh, DOC partnership agreement and costs remaining in that account for a separate potential commercial development. What's the nature of this separate potential commercial development? Is it phase two, Tony, perhaps? Yeah, I think there's two phases. There were originally three. We combined phase one and phase two. So it's the second phase of that development. Okay. Ah, this one's your, your ballpark, Craig. Last year when I was here, we talked about the 2027 master plan. Uh, specifically when I queried Larry on it, uh, a number of initiatives were held back because passenger growth had not met uh, the plan's indicated type of growth figures that justified some projects moving forward. With the improvement in passenger numbers and the strong reg revenues in 2013, will there be a resumption of planning for structures addressed in the 2027 master plan? And specifically, one of the projects that was delayed was the flyover runway planned to link the two main runways. Oh, the taxiway, you mean? Correct. It's a good question. It lies at the heart of our business as we try to match the uh, capacity that we have to the demand. And as you mentioned, uh, soon after the, that the last master plan was put in place, the, the Great Recession occurred. And it has taken us five years to recover to the numbers. Now, we're really on a great growth trajectory right now. So our engineering team is actually working some very complicated uh, simulations to tell us when these trigger points are. Um, the North-South Taxiway, for example, is a very interesting uh, uh, project which will link the two uh, uh, easternmost uh, runway uh, points for 26 left and, and 08 right. Uh, it's a great idea. It's just a question of when is the exact moment in time to, to pull that trigger. Same for expanding the terminal. We need to know, okay, when, when is our demand uh, going to exceed our capacity and then you want to get that within a couple of years you can always massage it through the use of buses or some other techniques you know if you have some extra flights but you don't want to do that for very long so it's a very tricky question certainly in the next 10 years we see those as uh, projects that we will be well seriously looking at starting and my final question has to deal with the uh, older section of what what used to be uh, the Vancouver Airport Terminal. It started out as a domestic terminal with an international arm. And over the years, uh, we've, the airport authority has constantly modified it. Uh, we're now at a po an interesting point where we have put so much infrastructure in an old building that we're starting to have some major headaches, uh, particularly people that I work with that uh, report to uh, myself uh, as a machinist union representing people who are out there uh, on the tarmacs. The C-45 area has arrived at a point where it has exceeded the capacity of its plumbing. And it has had problems now of a recurring nature since 2010. Uh, there have been 
remedial efforts to fix these things like pumping out and sump pumps and uh, uh, plumbing snakes and, and whatever, but there really needs to be a serious effort made to solve a problem where the plumbing needs of that existing structure have existed the original piping that's down there. What is the airport authority going to do about a problem that's been outstanding now for almost four years? Now, it's a very good question again, and it, uh, it speaks to what we have to do is to keep rebuilding the airport, as it were, as we grow. Um, we're actually building a bypass pipe to take all the sea pier sewage uh, in a big bypass pipe past the terminal and into the main, uh, the main uh, sewage exit, if you will. Um, that's going in this year? Designed this year, built next year. So, so I won't have to raise this subject next year. I really wish you wouldn't. <laughs> Thank you, Craig. Thank you, David. Hi there. My uh, name is Roy Grinchman. I'm just a concerned citizen and big fan of the airport. Um, this is my fourth public meeting that I'm here, so not quite the track record of David, but I wanted to thank David for two reasons. Number one, for holding the airport accountable every year, but more importantly and selfishly, for making my comments appear brief, despite the fact that I have a, a, quite a few sets of questions myself. Thank you for that service to me. Um, I open every year, and I'm going to do it this year as well, with uh, kudos. I think the airport is phenomenal, as was opened by our, our first speaker. Um, I personally had a uh, very traumatic experience where I lost my phone. It was handled impeccably uh, in terms of the recovery. Everybody knew exactly where the forum was when they uh, checked it out in the database. They routed me to the right person, then when I picked it up, they queried me appropriately to make sure it was mine. That, the, the free Wi-Fi, the, the improved seating in some sections of the airport terminal, just great amenities, and you're very deserving of your awards and kudos, so I acknowledge that to start with like I do every year. Thank well you very done. much. Um, this year, however, this is the first time that I have a brick bat to throw at the airport, um, so I do so very respectfully. Um, last year, I asked uh, a number of questions and was told that uh, the airport would follow up, and that hasn't happened, so I'm sure it was an oversight, but I'm going to re-ask those questions now and would ask, please, for a follow-up on them uh, this year. The three questions I had were around the, uh, the pricing policy for merchants here, and I was told that in terms of fair pricing, at least last year, Larry Berg answered that what uh, is... Uh, to be adhered to is high street pricing. So what you might find on Robson Street, you should find here. So at least in the case of certain uh, franchisees uh, for food and beverage, that's not the case. Last year I pointed to Burger King being an example of that. There's no Burger King this year, so I can't point that out. But I did actually check with Subway, and, and that's another example. Um, so I'd like uh, the airport to take another look at, at that maybe and, and uh, report back. I will do that. Thank you. Um, the second comment was um, I asked for more slides on the Vantage Airport group because this is really the only opportunity to get more information about them. So I hope next year we'll have maybe two or three slides specifically about them. Um, and then I also asked, and this admittedly is the most complicated request, if uh, it would be possible to at least take a look at extending one more Canada Line train at night. And the reason for that is because there's a late night Air Canada flight where you can just make that last train if all the stars align, but they usually don't. Um, and so uh, if there's uh, an extra few minutes of baggage or whatever, one more train might help. So I, I acknowledge the difficulty there, but I was wondering if, as a key partner, you would take one look at that. No, thank you. We'll look at it. I just want to point out that we do not operate the train. So what we're doing is we'd be making a request to Transpo, I think it is, who operates the train to put on one more train for that flight. But note it, and, and we'll look into it. Or alternatively, again, admittedly very complicated, maybe or, uh, schedule the plane to come in 10 minutes earlier if that's at all doable. Uh, I hear you. I, think I already I saw Mark from Air Canada. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think I'll go with the first, the first okay. option. Thank okay. you. Um, now I've got my questions for this here. Um, we talked about a very negative outcome for Vantage in terms of $49 million loss. I first had a clarification. Is that the overall net impact to uh, YVR is a $49 million loss, or is that just specifically on that one particular project that you lost money, but overall might have made more? No, it's generally, I mean, within a few million, that Liverpool uh, loss, which gets recorded up to our consolidated books. We have to show it, although it really doesn't affect the 
the economic underpinnings of, of this airport. And as Glenn said, what we really lost there was about half of the profit we made when we sold half of, uh, of Vantage to city infrastructure investors. So although we have to show it on our books because it's a subsidiary, it, it really it doesn't uh, reflect an economic loss of this airport. Okay, so then my question would be, what is the net contribution this year of Vantage when you look at all of its activities? Minus 49. Oh, minus 49. Million. Okay, yeah. sorry, that's, that was the clarification I was seeking. Um, uh, one more question on Vantage. Overall, what is your, I don't know if forecast is the right word, but what are you looking for in terms of, of the contribution that it should make to your uh, bottom line every year? I mean, what's, what's the predicted forecast? Is that's it a, a very 2%? good question. Is it a 10%? We don't have a, a hurdle rate, internal rate of return. Um, there's really two parts to why we're, we're in Vantage. Uh, it's to have an equity stake in airports around the world and, and to uh, uh, hopefully to have a, a profit uh, from that system. But also it's a great opportunity for our staff to travel to other airports, to help them out and to come back with ideas. And just in the past two weeks we had somebody from our commercial department in Nassau, not a bad thing for her, uh, but she went there and she got huge kudos because she helped out that airport with uh, their commercial marketing plan. We had Reg Craig, I think I saw Reg in the audience, Reg was in Cyprus working on the customer care there and he'll pick up ideas and bring them back here. So one of the, the two reasons are yes to be an equity investor but also to have a transfer of ideas and people between ourselves and uh, airports around the world and that's been uh, really successful for us. Great answer, thank you for that. Um, I wanted to ask a little bit of the EU uh, Open Skies Agreement, which was ratified by Parliament last year. I know there's a big focus on South America and the Asia Pacific. I understand the geographies there. Um, but uh, apart from Iceland Air, who I think this year is going to start serving here, have you seen any facilitation because of those rights, or that just doesn't play for Vancouver? I'm thinking specifically around Turkish Airlines, around law, Polish, and maybe a direct flight to Paris finally. Now, it's, that is an excellent question because I think sometimes in – my zeal to talk about the opportunities in Asia, you know, you forget these others. But we're talking to airlines all over the world all the time. And we're very excited to have, for example, Iceland Air, which is a great uh, airline flies to Reykjavik, and from Reykjavik you can fly all through Europe. Uh, I would note last year, very successful launch of a second flight to Germany with Lufthansa. So, you know, for 20 years, 25 years, you had one flight to Frankfurt, and then with a jumbo, a same size aircraft, started up and you know we were worried a little bit that there might be some cannibalization that would be natural they both flew at over 90 percent full all summer so they're actually started I saw two Lufthansa jets out on the ramp yesterday I said well they've started early this year because it was so successful so we still see opportunities there you're right to point out Turkish one of the fastest growing and biggest uh, airlines in in uh, that part of the world and we're talking to all those airlines have we seen an uptick because of the uh, signed agreement no not yet although we would say that it really is silly to have free trade without open skies. So one of, the, one of our things going forward, as soon as we have a free trade agreement, should be open skies. Okay, glad to hear that. Um, two more quick sense of questions and that's it. Um, I wanted to ask you, you've done a lot of talking uh, about uh, airline liberalization within Canada. There's been a little bit of an editorial duel between you and, and Air Canada on that, uh, on that front. You saw I, that. I, I've seen that. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask whether YVR is going to be taking or has at this time uh, a, a lobbying position around an Air Passenger Bill of Rights. It almost came up last year with the throne speech. I suspect it might come up around election time. So is there a position that the airport has around that? I haven't seen the legislation or the proposed idea. The idea of protecting passengers' rights, I'm completely uh, in accord with. The actual details of how you do it, I think you have to be very careful. I've, I have some experience with those uh, such bills in Europe, and they can actually have an unintended side effect. Uh, so uh, in theory, yes, we're all for a passenger's bill of rights. I just want to see exactly how they roll that out. Okay, my last question, uh, which is actually a suggestion around the outlet mall. Uh, I'm a big supporter of this as an additional revenue stream as you are diversifying in many different areas to help uh, uh, fund the airport, so kudos on that. I was wondering if you would consider, with the development of the outlet mall, two very high profile, um, let's call them pickup desks, airside on the domestic and on the international side, so that conceivably somebody could go to the website of individual stores at the outlet mall or the outlet mall itself if it has it, and they, if they only have a two hour layover here and they don't have enough time to get out, do security, come back, purchase their items uh, online, pick them up airside here, 
possibly even inspect them before they actually pay for them, um, but make them high profile visible counters so that people are aware of the service. Again, an advantage for people to connect through YVR because of the service. I love the idea. Uh, the only thing I worry about is getting those goods, goods through security. That is a trick. It's not only a trick for the goods, it's a trick for customs. But having said that, it's a great idea. Um, Tony's Sorry. sitting right there, uh, Glenn's sitting there, you can talk to them and, and uh, they could, uh, maybe there's something with, to that. So thank you, great idea. Thank you as well. Okay, that's it for questions. I'll turn it back over to Mary. Well, thank you, Craig, and thanks for all of you for your attention and your great questions. Um, just as a reminder, those interactive displays are still up outside, and we'll have various executives and team members around if there are any other questions. I'd like to thank you all very much for uh, coming out this afternoon. I now declare the meeting terminated. Thank you. <laughs>